worry about being good or bad at this. I just have to show up, I have to listen, and I have to work hard. Hello and welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 296. And today, we're joined by Mr. John English. If you're new to the show, you might want to head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out all of our episodes, including show notes, like for this one, where we help you find the social media, the websites, show you photos and videos of our guests, of the topic shows that we do on Thursday, and really just give you a lot more context for the episodes that you're listening to. For most episodes, we even have a transcript. We're going back, we're transcribing all the older ones from before we started transcribing. Really, it's just all about helping you relate to the episodes and get as much possible value out of them. And for all of this, we charge a whopping nothing. But if you would like to support us, and thank you for everyone who has, you could head on over to whistlekick.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can check out the products that we're making. We're always rolling out new stuff. And if you have any questions, of course, you can reach out to me, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. You can email. I already said that. You can find us on social media. There we go, at whistlekick. And really, we're just, we're all over the place to help you, the traditional martial artist. Today's guest comes from not too far away from the state to my east, New Hampshire. And Mr. John English is an owner at Karate International, and he is the instructor, the mentor to a guy who's become a good friend of mine. Shout out to Craig, who connected us. So with that connection, you know, I knew that this gentleman would probably have some good stories. You know, you can usually tell the quality of an instructor by his students. And this particular school I've been to a couple times, they've got some great students. But I wasn't prepared for how good these stories were. Mr. English has amazing stories and tells them in a compelling way that I know you all are going to love. We talk about everything from his time in the ring to his time in the ring as a referee to starting a martial arts school or really taking over a martial arts school really early, earlier than I'm going to guess nearly anyone else listening has ever done or even heard of. So that's kind of cool. I'm not going to tell you any more, though, because I'd rather it come from him in his own words. So let's welcome him to the show. Mr. English, it's Jeremy Lesniak. Hey, Jeremy, how are you? I'm doing great, sir. How about you? I'm great. Great. Thanks for calling. Yeah, th- thanks for doing this. No sweat. I look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. It's, are you having the, the beautiful, sunny morning that we're having a couple hours north of you? Yeah, yeah, we actually are, which is uh, which is nice with the winter we've had. It seems no like kidding. it's going to go right from winter to to summer. Right. So it's kind of same as last year, but there were, can't there was, complain. There was that forty-eight hour period, what a couple of weeks ago, that we went from snow to eighty. I think we hit eighty-six up here. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was, yeah, I know it's crazy. <laughs> That's why we live in New England. Though. It is, it is, because you know you can't get bored. No, you can't get bored with can't. the weather. There's always you. You always have to shovel something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, dirt or snow. <laughs> dirt or snow. <laughs> Sometimes both. Yeah, exactly. At the same time. Yeah, tell me about it. Are you a native New England? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. We uh, grew up in Mass. Um, moved around a lot as a kid, and then um, you know, it's actually one of the reasons that it got me into martial arts. So, um, but yeah. How did? Yeah, tell me more. How did, how did that? How did those? Are we are we, are we taping right now or? Well, so I always give people the option, you know, and and this okay. is, um, you know, for some of the conversations that I have, we kind of start when the call picks up, so the listeners would hear that, and and if you listen to episodes, especially the more recent ones, sometimes we do this, and we've actually had a lot of really positive feedback. People, you know, like that it just kind of starts organically from moment one, uh, but at the same time, if you want to you know, chat, quote unquote, off air, you know, and we can start a little more formally. That's fine. Whichever is going to make you more comfortable. No, it's, I'm a little more organic, to be honest with you. Um, I'm not, not much of a canned guy. So, okay, well then, then um, we can just let it roll and, and see where we go and. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. But yeah, yeah. I uh, grew up in New England, um, started in Massachusetts and parents moved us around a lot. Uh, so between uh, the time I was born and, geez, let's see here, probably sixth grade, I think I was in four or five different school systems. Wow. Um, 
so I was always a new kid and that, that kind of did a number on my psyche, um, you know, as a kid. So I was kind of, kind of the overweight, overweight kid, didn't have a lot of self-esteem. I was always a new kid. So I had an identity, you know, problem. And so finally come sixth grade, my dad decided he wanted to build his first house and they, they bought a piece of property in 1985 up in Hampton Falls. And, um, he built his first house. I was part of that process. And then again, going into sixth grade, I was a new kid uh, in a new town. And about a year after that, just really, you know, kind of made the decision. I wanted to uh, start martial arts training. And, you know, it was funny. My mother asked me, she's like, why do you want to do that? And I didn't tell her the real reason. The real reason was me. Everyone was telling me I was going to get, you know, I was going to get beat up in high school. And so, you know, unbeknownst to my mom, you know, I said, oh, you know, I really love it, watching the movies and, and seeing all those moves. You know, I never really told her the truth. And so that year, I think it was in uh, 87, February of 87, I, uh, I started my first, took my first class, and it was a school in Exeter. And it was, it just, I was hooked. Right away, I was hooked. It was great. And just, uh, that's, that's kind of the, the backstory of how I got involved in martial arts. Now, I'm curious, here you are, you know, traveling around, different schools, you're the new kid. And you said, you know, you had low self-esteem. You said you were overweight. For a kid in that position to want to take on something new, to try something new, something physical even, you must have had a pretty solid idea of what, or at least a solid belief of what martial arts would be and how it would be beneficial to you. And I'm curious where that belief came from. Well, and that, and that's, it's, 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 it's funny you say that because it's, you know, when you, when you have a kid or you have someone in, in doing self-reflection here and thinking about this, I mean, when you have fear, there has to be a greater fear in order you to get out of the fear you're in. And for me, it was, you know, the thought of being physically hurt, you know, and beat up. I was, it was, you know, very, very scary to me. And so the only thing I could think of, and because, again, I was the type of kid that loved movies. I mean, I grew up with movies. You know, my dad, I, I think I was probably three years old. He took me to the first Star Wars movie, and I actually remember it. And, I mean, I have a, I have a two-and-a-half-year-old son now. I can't even imagine bringing him to a movie theater. But my dad did, and I, I just loved and grew up with movies. And so once I started getting older into the fifth grade and, and hanging out with certain kids, we loved, we loved the martial arts movies. You know, uh, all the ninja movies back then were huge in the '80s, and the Karate Kid was very, very influential uh, in '84 when that came out. And so, once this fear came of, man, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get killed in high school. These guys, these big kids are gonna, they're gonna destroy me. I just reverted back to what I know is watching kids fight on TV using martial arts and defending themselves. And so that seemed at, you know, 12 years old, <clears throat> excuse me, seemed like the most logical next step if I had any chance at all to protect myself, you know, when I went to high school in a year and a half, two years. Mm, okay. Now you get there, you've convinced your mother that this is a, a good thing for you to do. You go in with this belief of how it's going to go now i mean we know in hindsight that somehow this worked out because you're you're still trading you're teaching you know you, you're still involved heavily in the martial arts but i'm curious about those early days was it what you expected how did that go it it wasn't yeah, that's a great question um what did it go as i thought it would uh, i guess i guess yes and no that's that's a tough one because i just I remember getting in the class and just enjoying the structure and enjoying the exercise. And for a kid that wasn't very active growing up, that was something new. And I liked the way it made me feel at the end. And, and, and the positive reinforcement it gave, it almost it did its job in a way that it didn't solve the issue of me potentially getting beat up. That was still there. But what it did for me is it almost distracted me from that potential future. And what it did is it gave me an outlet and it gave me something to do. And it introduced me to a different way of life, a life of exercise. And that was completely contrary to the way I grew up. You know, I have 
a great family. My parents are still together. I mean, they've been married for almost 47 years. I have a younger sister. They did a great job raising us, but there's certain things that they didn't give us. And an active lifestyle is one of them. And so coming out of a home where, you know, again, movies, you know, they used to take us to the beach. I mean, that was about the extent of, you know, our physical activity. Um, you know, it was completely contrary. And so it was a whole new world that opened up and it got me focusing on something else. And so as I'm going through seventh grade and eighth grade, you know, I'm starting to get stronger and, you know, my confidence is increasing and I'm playing sports in school. And it was, it was just a complete, you know, transformation more from a mental and emotional side, you know, than it was a physical becoming tough physically tough and, and, you know, unbeatable that, that was, wasn't even thought about anymore when that was the initial, that's what I need to become if I'm going to survive in high school. I want to go back to one of the words you use because it, there's something that happens in the martial arts that doesn't happen in a lot of other places. And I don't think even the majority of martial artists, martial arts instructors are even aware of it. You mentioned structure. So here you are, you're a you're an overweight kid. You're not popular in the school. And if we exclude martial arts, your physical activity options are really freeform. If you're playing basketball, you have a ton of options. You can dribble the ball. You can dribble the ball in a lot of places. You can pass it to four other people. You know, if you're playing on a team, you can shoot it from anywhere on the court. And for someone who is not confident in their physical skills, that can be overwhelming. But yet you look at martial arts and the structure is there. When you're doing forms, which I've seen so many people that that step in in a kind of a similar place as as you're describing you were, oh, if I'm doing, you know, my basic form, you know, pinyon shodan, I look to the left, I turn, I do a low block. There's a correct way to do it. I'm allowed to not do it well when I start, but I know what I'm supposed to do. And I'm correct. curious, yeah. Yeah. you know, I'm, I'm curious if you've seen that in your teaching time and, and how, you know, it, am I, am I right? Was that, was that a, a, was that a hook for you at that time? Yeah, I think it was because, you know, going in and not being a physically gifted kid, uh, you know, not being the most athletic kid, it was it was great to be able to learn in a in a staged process. And I, I think the martial arts have a way of doing that, where it's very structured, in the sense it has a curriculum. You know, and it, it doesn't really matter the order you learn a certain punch or a kick or a technique. What matters is that you know everyone learns those in order to get to you know a higher level. You know, we'll say black belt. Um, And so being able to do that in in not having a ceiling, so to speak, like you do in team sports, where it's like you kind of win as a team, you lose as a team. Yes, I'm in a class with other people. Yes, we're all working on the same techniques. But, you know, if someone's better than me, that doesn't hold me down and it doesn't try to force me ahead. I'm I'm still working on an individual level. And, And that was probably, you know, one of the hooks for me was, you know, I don't have to worry about being good or bad at this. I just have to show up. I have to listen and I have to work hard and, you know, I can achieve my goal. And it's one of the other things I think that gravitated me towards Boy Scouts. I mean, I I got my Eagle Scout as a sophomore in high school. I started Boy Scouts when I was young. My parents got me involved in in Cub Scouts, Um, you know, it was off and on through the years because of, you know, the different moves and new towns and everything else. But I remember, again, I think it was sixth grade, we just moved into Hampton Falls and my dad built this house and we went to the school one night for a Boy Scout thing. And, um, you know, they, they gave a statistic that said, you know, 2% of all Scouts make Eagle Scout. And I remember even even at 12, I remember going, oh, 2%, wow, I, I, I'm going to be that 2%. I want to be that 2%. So as unconfident as I was as a kid, there was still something in me that, you know, wanted to be different. And going into martial arts, even then in like 87 was kind of, 
not it wasn't it wasn't popular it wasn't really still mainstream like it was uh like it is today and so going back to you know the structure of it yeah i, I think that was was definitely a hook uh to get me involved you know as you're you're talking about boy scouts and eagle scout i'm it's kind of funny because i'm seeing some similarities there that i don't think have come up on the show here we are nearly 300 episodes in and you know we 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 have new things that come up but it's not common that we have comparisons like this you know martial arts to scouting you know there's a fair amount of structure there too absolutely yeah with the ranks and everything else in yeah. scouting and i mean you can parallel the two of them obviously they have drastically different curriculums but there's still a curriculum um and, you know, you look at the martial arts being, it, it's very militaristic in its structure. You know, the Boy Scouts, you know, actually that's what it came from, was something for boys to learn just outdoor survival skills and, you know, different things like that, preparedness. And, you know, there's, there's a mental and emotional and physical aspect to both of them. And that's kind of why when I started teaching, fast forward a little bit uh, from my, my training, in 94, when I bought into the business, the martial arts school business, and said, you know, I, I want to kind of do something different using the experiences I've had in these different disciplines, you know, the scouting discipline, the martial arts discipline, and then obviously being raised by a dad who was a Marine who served in Vietnam, you know, so he, he was very, very heavy on discipline. And so using those three aspects is kind of how we created our program modern day in into karate international. Now forgive me for doing some math there but 7 years later you bought in to a martial arts school. You were 20? I was uh I was 19 actually. Okay. Uh, I was uh, 19 just turned I think yeah 19 just turned 19. That's not a common occurrence. So can you talk about that? Yeah, that's that's a great story in itself, man. <laughs> Holy cow! Uh, I always get emotional when I tell this story, just because it uh, it brings up some good stuff. But um, so it was, I earned my black belt in I think it was '93, and shortly after that, um, it was there was a chain of schools. There was about twelve of them in New England, and so my instructor who ran the Exeter location, you know, he was he was looking to kind of take a next step in his career. He was, he had been running the school for a while. He grew it and he kind of needed a new challenge. And so he decided to, you know, there's a, there was a struggling school in Portsmouth. He decided to go up there and take that over and made me an offer and said, Hey, you know, if you want, you can buy in, you know, it's $10,000. You'll get 10% ownership of the company. Um, and you can you can take over the school. And at that point for me, that was that was huge because I was kind of floundering. I I was an okay student in school academically, you know, I was a B C student. I didn't get great SAT scores. I was never a great physical or a written test taker. And that hurts you when it comes time to college. So, you know, everyone's putting their applications in senior year and here I am kind of holding the bag. I'm getting rejection notices in the mail just because my, my grades and my SAT scores weren't, weren't high enough. So at that time, uh, so my parents decided to move again and they want to go to Florida. My dad wanted to build a house down there. And at that point, my roots were established. I had my martial arts training. I had my friends. Um, I wasn't going. And they begged me to go, begged me to go. You can go to school for free in Florida. You know, why don't you go down and go to school? I, I, I dug my heels in and said, absolutely not. I'm not, I'm not moving again. I mean, this is my roots. This is my home now. And so reluctantly, they, you know, they said, okay, just do us a favor. You know, why don't you, why don't you go to Northern Essex? It's a local community college down in Haverhill. And I hesit hesitantly agreed, uh, but knew I needed some sort of job. And so I sat them down one night after my instructor gave me the offer to buy in and said, this is what I want to do. I need $10,000. And they flatly refused. They said, absolutely not. I don't think it's a good idea. You need to go to college. That's the only way you're going to be successful and get a good job. You know, this is just, 
this is a hobby. This isn't a good idea. And it, it got heated. It was, it was, we weren't talking for a while and it, it was pretty bad. And so that night that we had that sit down, my, at that time, I think she was about 85 years old. My grandmother, my dad's mom was, was in the house. Uh, her hearing wasn't the best. She had been losing her hearing for quite some time, but I think she heard enough. So a couple of days went by and I, I went back to the house and I walked in and my grandmother was there. I'm like, hey, Grammy, where's mom and dad? And she's like, oh, they're not here. She's like, come here, I got to talk to you. She grabbed me by the arm and I'll never forget it because she had this super strong grip. She grabbed me by the arm. She's like, what do you need? And I said, nothing. She's like, don't lie to me. What do you need? I, I heard you talking with your parents. What do you need? And um, I said, well, I, I have this opportunity. I, you know, I, I really want to. I really want to teach. I want to teach karate, and I have an opportunity to buy into this business. And it just—I don't think it's going to happen. And she's like, "Do you think you can be good at it?" And I said, "Yes, I can do this." And she's like, "I'll give you the money." And she she did. She gave me the money. She gave me five thousand um, dollars, which I tried to refuse, but there, there, you just couldn't. There was no way. And I told her, Grammy, I'll pay you back. I'll pay you back. And my father finally realized that I wasn't backing down on this, saw that, you know, his mother gave me five grand. And he relented. He, he took out a credit card. He got a $5,000 cash advance, which I had to pay for. I had my 10 grand, and I was, I was off to the races. And that's how I got started. Mm. Now, what, what did the next couple months look like? Because I'm, I'm imagining... You know, you're you're meeting this this debt obligation. I'm sure you're taking some kind of a salary from the school. Maybe if yeah. the school is profitable, you know, ten percent owner, you've got a little bit of of extra coming in on top had, of that. No, it, no, man, it was brutal. Okay, but that, that was kind of where I was going. I can't imagine that this is a large amount of money, especially if if ownership and and the teaching is is transitioning. Anybody that's ever watched any business transition, who's running it, there's always a a dip. It follows. So I'm guessing some of the students left because you were different. You weren't this individual, yeah. this other gentleman. So yeah. What so did what happened is, what is once like? he, yeah, once he, once he decided to go to Portsmouth, obviously he, he had a following and anyone that's involved in martial arts knows it's, it's very much a personality based business. You know, you get attached to your teachers and your instructors. Um, and it's very, it's very difficult sometimes when someone new steps in, um, to be able to continue to train just because you, you have such such a, a tight relationship well, with the person in your teacher. So, you know, the school took a huge step. Um, and it went from, just, I don't even remember the numbers back then, but, you know, it, it, it took a, a big enough dip that it wasn't doing the numbers it was. And so here I am, 19 years old, and I have this credit card payment I got to make every month for the money that you know, I bought into the business with, I had rent, I had food, I had gas, I had insurance. I, in essence, I was on, I was on my own. I was a hundred percent on my own. So it was, it was, it was a struggle for the first couple of years. And, you know, there was, there was times when, <clears throat> excuse me, not making rent and, you know, you're eating tuna because that's all you can afford. In the summertime, I used to go down because I, I, my buddy's parents had a basement apartment down on Boar's Head in Hampton Beach. So in the summertime, I used to I'd spearfish, and I'd jump in the water, and I'd grab a couple flounder, and that was dinner. That was dinner that night. And so it was, I was definitely a starving artist in the beginning. It, it, it took me a while to really get my feet on the ground where I was sustaining myself in a comfortable way through the business. But it was, yeah, the first couple of years were tough. I want to talk about those first couple of years. You know, just statistically, the majority of people listening right now have never started a business or taken over a business, run a business. I've started a few. So I understand what that mindset is. I understand what it's like to be in that space with no money and, and trying to build something. I mean, that that's that's the story of Whistlekick. I mean, truly, I was down to my last $1,000 with nothing coming in going, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I'd love for you to talk about where your head was at there. 
you know, here you are with, with passion starting out. I don't know if your passion dwindled. I don't know if you thought about giving up, but I'm going to guess that there's, there's something in there that maybe because you were a martial artist, you were able to, to move forward a little bit differently than someone who was, who isn't a martial artist might've. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I don't know if it was that or just, uh, being naive, being young and being naive. In, in essence, I think that can sometimes be a gift because at that age, I wasn't thinking about a business failing. I was just thinking about, I love this. This is my career and it's going to work. And as hard as it was, I just knew you just every day you put your shoes on, you get to the school and you work the school. And I had a good support group in the sense that, you know, my instructor, he had, a, he had a very good business sense about him. And so I had support there. You know, it wasn't like he was gone. He was still around. And we would meet weekly for meetings. He would recommend, you know, different audio cassettes to listen to in the car. And so I had some direction. It wasn't like I was on this island all by myself and didn't know what to do. I knew what I needed to do. And I had the support there when I didn't. I had that phone call. So I, I, I had a business mentor, you know, which is huge. But that and I think being naive uh, were probably the two greatest gifts I had because it, failure wasn't an option. You don't even think about it. It's like, this is my job. This is my career. I love doing this. And it's going to work. There's, there's, no other, there's no other option at that point. And so I think, I think those two things together was part of the reason why the success started to come. Talk about that success, that transition from eating tuna and fish you caught yourself <laughs> to something more. Um, it's a process, you know, and I think, I think people think, you know, you look all over the news and you look in the media and you, you hear of, of these business people who they, and they just, they make it big one day. I don't believe that. I think it's a process. Um, you know, we try to speed the process up. We speed it up in a 60 minute phone call or a 30 minute television show. But at the end of the day, there's years and years and years of foundational stuff that takes place in a person's life to get them to the point where they hit that breakthrough you know, and for me, it was, it was a nibbling process. It was, you know, each year the school would grow a little more. It would grow a little more. Uh, you know, I had more opportunity where my name was getting into the community more. I was starting to get into the school systems. I was getting to know the local teachers. They were seeing what I was doing. I'm coming in as a guest teacher for a gym class program. And so now I'm, uh, now I'm exposed to all of these kids in the community, and I'm exposing them to martial arts in a way that I wasn't, I didn't get exposed to. I got exposed to it through the movies. You know, now I'm able to use gym class, which I think for elementary and even junior high school kids is how they get exposed to different sports to see if it's something they want to pursue. So now I have a platform where I'm able to, you know, expose these kids to what real martial arts is, you know, and so that started to help. And the school started to grow. It started to grow and, you know, it became, geez, at our peak, we, we started to peak out at, uh, we were close to 300 active students by 2004, 2005. So in about a 10 year period, you know, we over, you know, came pretty close to tripling the school. What do you chalk that up to? Oh, hard work. Absolutely. I mean, being, you know, you you can relate to this as well. I mean, being a business owner, the great thing about it, there's no there's no ceiling, but yet there's no safety net either. And so you have to you have to be self disciplined to go to work. And it's so easy to, you know, bag it that day and go to the beach in the summer because you know the attendance is down and everybody's on vacation and you know we just got to. You know, I'll take today off. And you have to be a self-disciplined person to know that you have to work your business. You, you don't have someone doing it for you. You're a small business owner, and you wear a lot of different hats. 
You know, you're the instructor, you're the janitor, you're the accountant, you're the marketer, and you have always have a job to do. And the second you stop doing one of the jobs, the business starts to get affected. And so with my background, again, coming from, I'll give my dad the credit first, he instilled in me such a strong, strong work ethic. I mean, at four years old, I had to be out stacking wood on a Saturday when all I wanted to do was watch Saturday morning cartoons. He's he's an electrician by trade, and on Saturday mornings during the fall, he used to have to go set up the speaker systems at Tufts University uh, because that's who he worked for, and he used to bring me with him. And so I was up at 6 in the morning on a Saturday in the truck going to Tufts, and I remember, you know, four, five, six years old, go get me, go get me the Romex. I knew what Romex was at that age. He taught it to me. I used to run down the bleachers and get it, bring it back up. You know, so he was instrumental in giving me that work ethic. You have to work hard for things you want in life. Then my martial arts instructor, you know, I would say would come second, where, you know, taught me that if you set a goal and you work hard, you can achieve it you know, and gave me the self-confidence that I needed, you know, to be able to do it and also giving me, you know, the business side of it after I got my black belt in, in, in teaching me the business of martial arts. Um, you know, he was extremely influential, obviously. And then obviously my background in scouts and high school sports and the coaches that I had in my life and the people, you know, all the people you start reflecting on that, you know, kind of planted seeds in you that helped you to blossom over time. Mm. Okay. Now, knowing what you know now, especially after seeing that success, you know, post the, the two years, we'll call the dry spell. If you were to go back and do all of that again with what you know now, what would you have done differently? Um, that's a great question. That's a great question. And, my initial reaction to it is I don't know if I do anything different because it got me to where I am today. You know, if you start tweaking the past, is it, could it affect the future? Absolutely. But I think you might be missing some lessons in the process. Um, you know, I, I, I guess, I guess the one thing that I, I would have to say that I would change is just learning a better money management system in, in getting some more mentoring and counseling in just, basic accounting in, in money management. I, I think we all, as much as martial arts and, you know, other things teach us and help us with discipline, I think we all have, we still all as human beings have certain struggles, you know, and again, I, I never learned money management. I think money management is something that comes from our upbringing. And when you have a blue collar worker like my dad who works six days a week, I mean, it was feast or famine when recessions hit. You know, we stayed home. There was no money, you know, but when the booms were going on, we would, they were taking us to Disney World and Hawaii for family vacations. And so I saw, I saw the highs and the lows of that. And I think as a business owner, we tend to kind of mimic our, uh, our financials based on maybe how we were raised. Uh, and so... You know, in, in, in retrospect here and introspection, as you're asking the question, I would probably have to say getting a mentor with some sort of teaching you that discipline of money management and how to be disciplined with money would probably be the biggest thing. Mm. And, I, and I just want to echo that from not simply the, the martial arts perspective or, or the business perspective, but from the life perspective. The, the number one skill and... I saw this as, you know, as someone who used to hire people and I mean, just general observation that people don't have when they come out of high school is the ability to manage their own finances. Correct. I agree. 100%. You know, we understand the math of, okay, money in, money out. And we think that that's all it is, but it's so much more than that. The idea of, of applying cash flow, which we often think about as a, a business thing only is, is just as valid on a personal end. And I'm surprised how often we as martial artists who are conditioned from day one to find someone to look up to that knows more than us to teach us how often we do not do that when it comes to martial arts business. We assume that we are the only ones that know our schools, whereas we assume that 
our ideas are the only ideas. And and I'm I'm not laying that out, you know, universally, but in my travels, and I'm curious if you would agree, it seems to be much more common than it isn't. I would agree. And it's and again, this is it's one of those things where you know, you look at it and you look at martial arts and, and all the buzzwords are always used, you know, respect and humility and discipline. But let let's face it, again, we're we're human beings and you know we have our own biases and ideologies and personalities and in sometimes in the areas that are supposed to exemplify certain traits, um, don't. And I think as as great as the martial arts are, you know, you, you get egos, you get pride. And so as school owners, sometimes you don't want anyone knowing your numbers. You know, how many students you have, that number always gets inflated because that's based on, you know, your level of success. You know, it's kind of like rank. Well, if you're fifth degree black belt, you're, you're better than the, the brown belt. And so that gets translated over into the business side. And you've got guys that just, they have no humility and they don't want to ask for help because that's weakness. I can't ask for help. And I never subscribe to that and, and always realize just like training, if I want to get better in a certain discipline, I got to go find a teacher that knows more than I do. In in transferring that over into the business is the same thing. So we started, you know, early, early days, one of the biggest jumps that the school made is we got on a, we started using a billing company, which at, at that time was a little taboo. You didn't necessarily want someone seeing your numbers, but that was one of the influential um, things to help us with our growth. And then we started doing these round tables and business seminars where school owners would get together and discuss different strategies on marketing, about class structure, about rates, and all of the different things that school owners go through. And, and sometimes just even just kind of complain, you know, about, you know, when you lose students and how discouraging it is and disheartening and everything, and, and just, you know, kind of talk that through and, and so that's, you know, that was one of the major reasons why our school started to grow. As I, I, was never, I was never too good for something. I, it didn't matter what it was. If someone had something to me that, you know, I, I felt I could make work at my school, I would do it. I would do it. There wasn't a lot of pride there. The pride was getting the school to grow. That was... That was what we wanted, and not just get the school to grow, but get it to grow in a way that we were producing quality students, and that was really important for me, too, because I, I decided at a very young age that if I was going to do this, my dad always taught me you do it right, and you do it right the first time because your name is everything, and when people hear your name, you want to know that they think of integrity, honesty, because you can't buy that. And so with our students, we wanted to make sure, you know, ranks were earned, you know, and earned for the individual in that just attending wasn't enough. It wasn't just a matter of coming to class. That's not, that's the easy part. You had to come to class, you had to work hard. You know, you had to learn what you needed to learn and you had to listen. And, and those are the characteristics that, that really helped us shape the school and the growth of the school. And so it wasn't just about coming to karate class to learn a front punch to get my yellow belt. Well, Mr. English also wants us to make sure that we're listening in school. And so we started sending out teacher sign-off things when it came time for belt time. Teacher at school had to sign it, saying the kid was, you know, listening, behaving in the classroom, you know, doing the best they can. I didn't care if they had A's or not. They could have had D's, and then the teacher could still sign as long as their conduct and effort were there. And then mom and dad had to sign it at home, you know, to make sure that, you know, kids doing their best at home. They're listening. They're being respectful. And, and I think that was another catalyst that really helped us to grow the school in numbers, but also in quality. Who are you looking to now for growth and education? Oh, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm in a kind of in a different phase in, in my career right now. I, I'm, I'm heavily involved um, in refereeing MMA events. 
Um, I've had the uh, privilege and opportunity to work for Bellator, uh, flying overseas. I've gone to uh, Italy to judge an event. And so now it's, it's my mentors have, have changed. I've, I've kind of got my school in a groove uh, where I want it, where it's manageable. I have a staff that I've developed over the years that have the same vision I do and that are going to take the school into the next generation. But I've, I'm moving on to my, my refereeing. So guys like John McCarthy, I meet with uh, a couple times a year, actually become friends with. A good friend of mine from Watertown, Mass., Kevin McDonald, who's probably one of the best, if not the best, referee in the Northeast, if not the East Coast. He... Um, he does uh, referee uh, train judging training courses uh, all over the country. Uh, he's a mentor and a, and a very close friend. Um, I've gotten to know Rob Hines, who's an Illinois referee that's done major UFC shows and Bellator shows. And so uh, I'm kind of I'm, I'm in the inner circle now of the Association of Boxing Commissions and Combat Sports. You know, I'm a key figure in one of their committees, a charitable committee, which is uh, is something we're working on right now for the Orlando show, uh, or excuse me, Orlando convention. Uh, so once a year, and these people are some of the greatest minds in the country, actually internationally, uh, for boxing, wrestling, MMA, kickboxing, Muay Thai, and it's it's kind of become that's my next passion, and that's kind of really what I've been working on, and just looking to network with the best in this area uh, to help me to continue to grow. Awesome. What makes a good MMA referee? <laughs> um, decisiveness. Decisiveness, I, I would say, is the most important quality. You, you are forced to make a decision in the blink of an eye. And once the decision is made, it has to stay made. You can doubt yourself. You can reflect. You can I screwed up. I made the wrong call. You have to stick with your call. Uh, you can't waver. And you can't look to have people, everyone like you, because they're just not. There's got to be one winner and there's got to be a loser. And sometimes in close fights, you have to make a judgment call. And someone's not going to like it. And you're going to get blasted by the media and you're going to get blasted by coaches in fans and fighters, but you have to stay true to the decision you made and you can't waver. And so decisiveness is probably the most important quality you've got to have as a MMA referee. I think you could almost make the same evaluation of being a fighter. Yes, absolutely. You know, as a fighter though, on for a uh, fighter in this is coming from someone that's competed um, so I'm, I'm going in there with, I, I know what these guys go through. I know what it's like to do a 10 week training camp to get ready for a fight. Um, but I only have to worry about me in there and what I want to do and what my opponent is trying to do to me as a referee. I got to worry about two guys. And so, you know, as a fighter, you still, it's still a little bit easier in the sense that I just got to worry about me and what I'm doing and protecting myself and my offense. And the other guy's trying to do the same thing. And we're, they're each in trying to impose their will on each other. But I got to watch both of them at the same time. And the three main things a referee is there for is one, A number one, always fighter safety. We want these guys to be able to compete, but we want them to sustain the minimal amount of damage as possible. All right, the second is to make sure the rules are enforced so it's a fair playing field. And the third thing is to make sure the integrity of the contest stays at that event. And that doesn't waver. And so, again, going back to kind of level playing field. And so, as a referee, you know, I've, I've called fights early. I'd rather call 100 fights early than call one fight too late and have a guy take damage that could permanently affect him the rest of his life. And that's a dilemma every time we step in there, is to give them the opportunity to win, but not at the sake of their long-term health. Hmm. And that's, that's the hardest part. That's the hardest part. It's got to be hard. And anybody that's ever watched amateur MMA has likely seen 
fights end seemingly very early. Because, of course, the more novice someone is as a fighter, the more you're trying to protect them. Yes, and that's and that comes down to, again, setting the stage, and I think running a martial arts school for as many years as I have has, has been very influential in, in helping me succeed in this area is just pre-framing what the expectations are before the event. And so when you're having your rules meeting, you know, we, we tell these guys as amateurs, listen, you know, I can stop a fight without a tap. And they look at you like, no, you can't. Like, well, you guys are amateurs. If you're in a straight-out arm bar and your method of defense is just biting down on your mouthpiece and grunting, thinking you're going to be able to muscle your way out, that's not an effective defense. You're going to get your arm broken. I can stop the fight without a tap. Same thing on a choke. If I'm not seeing you actively trying to escape that choke, I don't need a tap to stop the fight because we want you guys to get the experience that you're going to need to get in order to turn pro. Now, once you turn pro, if you make the decision that you want to get your arm broken, I'm going to let you get your arm broken without a tap. But as soon as I see a break, the fight's over. And it's, it's, it's getting them to understand that and pre-frame it. And usually when you do that, a good effective rules meeting, you will curve a lot of your problems. It's when that communication doesn't take place and everyone has their own perception of what's going to happen and then something interrupts that is where you get to controversy. You mentioned that you'd spent some time competing. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I, I dabbled uh, as an amateur kickboxer. Um, I had a couple of amateur kickboxing fights. I had one MMA uh, amateur fight. I realized I was a, a better coach and teacher than I was competitor. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really have much to brag about other than I'm really good at getting punched and kicked. <laughs> There's a skill in that. Uh, I don't know if it's a good skill. <laughs> Well, you know, I got a hard head. I mean, I, I, I know I can take a beating if I need to. But again, that's not something to be proud of because the long-term effects of that, we're starting to see it in, in, in some of these sports of guys that have taken years and years of abuse. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about at the convention and one of the constant training that we're trying to do with referees is, you know, CTE, you know, in the effects of, you know, trauma in being knocked out and even sometimes not necessarily knocked out, but just taking blows to the head over and over and over again. And what they're finding is the long-term effects of that with early onset Alzheimer's and dementia and just so many, so many issues that can occur that this sport is still so new. I mean, 93, really, it started it really became, started coming mainstream around 2008, and now where we are, it's still, we still have no idea. We're starting to see some of the effects um, as we are in the NFL with the concussions, you know, in the suicide rates and the depression of these athletes, and they're all, they're all starting to correlate that with the CTE and the, and the trauma that, that that brain takes from just being rattled inside a, a skull. Um, it's really starting to take an effect. Yeah, it, it's pretty amazing. I mean, on, on the one hand, you know, we're starting to see a lot of this pressure. And I, I don't, when we, when we talk about traumatic events, I don't think we're seeing it anywhere more concretely than youth football. And if anybody out there has kids that play football, You've likely noticed, unless you live in some of the big football areas like, you know, Texas, Alabama, some of those deep south states, the dramatic decrease in participation in football as we're, we're yeah. learning about what's going on there. But then on the other side, uh, listeners know that one of the things in addition to martial arts that I'm very passionate about is CrossFit and, and a lot of the information that's come out around nutrition through some of those circles talks about dietary things that are actually shown to reverse some of this brain damage. So it's fascinating to me, kind of on both sides. And I'm, I'm excited to see as we become this, this society that, that seems to be craving more and more dramatic sporting contests, where will we be, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, you know, we've seen plenty of sci-fi movies that predict all these fights to the death by, you know, what, 2040 and and things like that. So, you know, are we going to get there? 
Yeah, and, and I think that's the great thing about it, too, is we're, uh, we're using the science now and we're becoming more educated. And you even look at, you know, uh, fighters, how they used to train in the early days. And I had the opportunity of, you know, Tony Fricklin was a guy that uh, he ended up making it to the UFC and he, he fought all over the world. And he was someone that in my early days we used to drive down to New Jersey together and train with. And, you know, the training back then was the hard sparring was done three or four days a week. I mean, full contact, hard. And now these guys are realizing that a lot of the abuse it's taking is done in in the training sessions. It's not the fight itself. It's all of the concussions and, and, and how many times they've been knocked out in practice in realizing that, hey, you know, we don't we don't need to take we don't need to take it that hard in training anymore. And the science is showing and guys are starting to see that they don't have to go hundred percent in training. Their hard sparring now is maybe seventy percent you know, in training up to a fight in that it's more about the skills in the drills and the conditioning um, is, is a bigger part of the sport now than just being the toughest guy in there that you're just constantly being bombarded, you know, with full contact strikes and training. You know, when you got a guy getting ready for a fight and he's doing, he's doing rounds and he's got a fresh guy every minute or two and he's going through five or six guys taking a pummeling absolute pummeling those days are over you know these these coaches have, have realized that they have to do something different to protect the longevity of this fighter so he can have a long career whereas guys back then it's you know they just you just the, the human body can't sustain that type of abuse for that long without some sort of damage occurring and so with the education and the science that are coming out i i, I see the sport you know, moving forward that way and between officials and corners and trainers and instructors and fighters starting to get on board and realizing, hey, you know, there's a there's a safer, more effective way of doing this. I think it's going to help everybody. And I think a long term and even with the football, you're right. The numbers are down now. But I think with some modifications with young kids focusing more on flag football, focusing more on skills and drills uh, when they're putting the pads on. I think, I think football will start to surge again because of, you know, the, the education that, that's happening now. Mm. What lessons are there for traditional martial arts schools, especially school owners and instructors, that we can take out of, you know, this, this change to training styles for full contact? Well, I, I think, you know, uh, for a while there, when UFC first came out and mixed martial arts first started to become prominent, it was, it was pitched to us as a style versus style event. Which style is the best? Which, which is the Mercedes of martial arts? And in the, uh, the initial events would pit karate against judo in Brazilian jiu-jitsu against American wrestling, and taekwondo versus kung fu. And that's how they started to sell it. And then I think, fast forward to where we are today, guys have realized it's not so much about a style versus style as it is taking, almost a Bruce Lee method, taking what works and not discarding it. So you've got guys like Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, who's a traditional karate guy, and you watch him fight, and he takes that side stance like you do in karate point fighting, and he's a master at it. Uh, Michael Page out of England, same thing. He's a karate guy, and he's making that work in, in the octagon. But then you, got, you still have your, your high-level BJJ guys. You know, Damian Maya, who's in his 40s and still fighting, using BJJ effectively you know, in the octagon. But every one of them have learned they have to have a basic knowledge of all of these arts in order to be effective in that sport. And as a martial arts school owner, we have to realize as much as we love it, it's still a sport and there's still rules. How we do our program, we need to continue to do our program. But we also have to be open enough to see, you know, that, Maybe a Muay Thai kick might be a little bit more effective in a certain situation than, say, a traditional karate kick would. 
um, if we're looking at a self-defense standpoint. If we're looking at it as a sport standpoint, that's different because sport has rules and can be manipulated. And so to that traditional school owner, do what you do, do it to the best of your ability and find the things that really, really work and focus on those, but also be humble enough to see certain things that don't work and don't be afraid to necessarily modify it for your students and give them the option. And I think that's what a good teacher needs to do is give the students the tools so the student can create their own toolbox. Because really, it's called martial arts for a reason. There's an artistic aspect to it. So I was taught all the tools, but I gravitate towards certain ones of them because of my body type, my height, my physical attributes, certain athleticism that I may or may not have. And so that's going to be different than the guy next to me who might be four inches taller and longer and faster than me. He has all the same tools I do, but he's going to utilize different ones in a different way to make himself unique in his own way. So we all really become a style within ourselves, And I think that's one of the beautiful things about martial arts as well. Mm. You're, you're talking about that diversity of training and, and being willing to look around and see what works. And of course you brought up Bruce Lee, who you know, was sort of the quintessential example of looking around at all the different options, taking what works, discarding the rest. If you had the opportunity to train with someone that you haven't yet to add tools to your toolbox, and let's say this person can be anyone from anywhere in time, who would you want to train with? That's a great question. And it's, I'm, I'm blessed in the sense that I kind of already have that at my disposal. I'm, I'm rubbing elbows with the highest people in the highest levels of this industry, you know, with the connections I have through the ABC uh, the connections that I have through, you know, my officiating. Um, and so I rub elbows on a daily basis with some of the top teams here in New England. I mean, I just saw Joe Lowe's on Friday night, you know, and we, we chatted with him just briefly. It was actually in passing. He had one of his guys fighting at the uh, reality fighting show uh, that I was officiating down at Mohegan. And, you know, there he is. And great guy. Joe's been around forever. He's such a humble guy. Great guy. But, I mean, if I called him up tomorrow, he, I, I know he, he'd be more than willing to let me go down and train with him. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm, I still i am in a funny stage in my life right now where I'm, I'm always looking for that new adventure. And so I've, a couple years ago I started another business and taking a lot of the principles I'm learning in martial arts and applying it to this new business. And, you know, I'm really trying to get that up off the ground really spending a lot of time, like I said, with my officiating. Uh, and, and that's kind of, that's, that's my training right now that I'm, I'm constantly looking to get better and better at in, in picking guys' minds and, and doing different seminars and training courses to, uh, to go to the next level with that. But that's probably the, sh- the short, long answer to your question. <laughs> nice, nice. What are your goals? You know, if you look out 5, 10, however many years you choose, what are you hoping to accomplish as a martial artist? Um, someone said to me once, and then this is, this is stuck with me for a long time. And it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's my mission statement. I, I tell all of my, uh, my high level kids that I, I work with my teenagers, we call it the varsity program. Some schools might call it a black belt program or black belt club we call varsity and it's it's kind of the highest level training for teenagers and the goal of that program is you know by the end of the senior year we're looking for them to potentially earn their adult black belt Uh, we we separate kids and adults when it comes to black belt but i tell them you know for me my mission statement is you know success is when you look back upon your life that other people were better off because you lived so every decision I make tries to go back to that mission statement. And so at this point, my goal in training my students is to make sure they're physically, mentally, and emotionally prepared for life. And so our program has, has kind of shifted to making sure that these kids are ready for the real fight. It's not a physical fight on the street. 
I've been doing martial arts now. I'm, I think this is my 30th year of training. I've never been in a physical fight on the street. And I tell a lot of people, like, that would be like a doctor going to school for 16 years and doing a residency, and they never treat a patient. It's like, why'd you do it? Why'd you spend all that time? So there has to be something more and deeper than just a physical skill. And so my goal moving forward in the future with this program is to produce physically, mentally, and emotionally tough teenagers that are going to become tough adults. So when life punches them in the face, they know how to react to it. Then when they don't get that job, um, that, that job they wanted, they know how to deal with that type of failure. That every time they get knocked down, they know how to get up and they know how to be self-motivated to do it and not necessarily rely on the world to pick them up and to provide for them that they have to do it themselves. That they have to fight. They have to fight their fight. And that's, that's, that's the mission of the school at this point. And that's where we want to be five years from now and 50 years from now. And even if I'm not involved anymore for whatever reason, and, and my man Craig takes over, that he's going to continue that tradition of producing physically, mentally, and emotionally tough kids, teenagers. And he's doing a great job. He's become, he's a, doing a, great he's job. become a good friend. Yeah. yeah. Now, if people want to reach out to you, if they want to find you online, whether that's social media or websites or, you know, whatever else you've got going on, what links should we drop in the show notes? Um, you can, we can go to uh, our web address, which is uh, K-I-M-A-C-N-H.com. That's abbreviated for Karate International Martial Arts Center, New Hampshire. All right, that's one. Um, my email address is actually on that site. They can email me directly. Okay. I'd really love to encourage uh, your listeners to to really try to support this charity uh, that we're working on, uh, the Retired Fighters Fund. It's put together by the Association Boxing Commissions and Combat Sports, which is a, a 501c3 organization, nonprofit. And the charity is really designed to help fighters uh, who've retired from the sport that might be going through a life challenge. They have uh, some sort of medical expense um, that's, you know, inhibiting them. They may not have the funds. They might be down on their luck. And this is a something that they can apply for a gift where, you know, we can try to help them out in, in a tough time. You know, the tagline of it is, you know, helping them with life fight when their career is over. And we all, we all go through tough times. And so, you know, I, I believe as a community, we're here to, to try to pick each other up when we, we fall down and help each other out whenever we can. And so this has been a great avenue for that. And the information on that is they can go to uh, abcboxing.com. And there's a tab that says Fighter Fund. And on that tab, they can actually make all donations through PayPal right on the website. And that would just be a huge blessing uh, for some of these guys. We gave out a gift last year to actually uh, Gary Goodrich. If uh, some of your listeners may remember Gary Goodrich from the old days, just an absolute beast of a man. He's, um, he's suffering the effects of CTE. He's having, he was having a lot of problems, and we were able to give him a gift last year to help with some medical expenses that he needed. And, um, you know, this year we're, we're looking at starting a college fund for a boxer who died in the ring. Uh, we want to start a uh, college fund for his two kids. And so that's going to be one of the gifts that we give this year. So to all my martial artists, um, you know, if you could support us in that, that would just be a huge blessing. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll drop those links and links and photos, other things that we've talked about today over on the show notes for anyone that might be new to this show. That's at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Well, sir, I really appreciate your time today. I appreciate all these wonderful, wonderful stories that you've shared. Had a good time getting to know you. Hopefully we'll connect in person at some point soon here. Absolutely. It was a blessing for me too. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I, I'm, I'm one of many stories. We all have a story. That's the great thing about it. And I think as, as being a martial artist, I've met, I've met people that relationships will last a lifetime. And so, you know, we all have our stories and that's the great thing about it. And being able to share it is, is just a blessing. And I just want to thank you and your listeners. Oh, you're welcome. And 
Yeah, and that's that's the beauty of the show as we bring people on and hear their stories. Before I let you go, I'd like to ask for just one more thing. We always ask our guests, you know, what parting words would you give to folks listening today? Keep fighting. You know, life's a fight, you know, and we're all a fighter. And so in between rounds, when you're sitting on your stool, and that's usually the time you're the most discouraged, hopefully you have a coach, you have an instructor, you have someone in your life that's going to give you the words that you need to hear to get back out there to fight for round two. So life is a fight. Don't, don't stop swinging. No matter how many times you get knocked down, you just got to keep getting back up. And that's, that's the true heart of a warrior. We all have it within us. We just have to learn to bring it out. I think if I have one takeaway from today's episode with Mr. English, it's that a student mindset, that humility, that white belt mentality that we sometimes talk about on the show, if you can hold that throughout your life, you can learn a tremendous amount and you can succeed more than you might otherwise. Because the ability to constantly look to other people for help, for advice, for growth is something that isn't just relevant when you start martial arts, but once you've been in it for a while and honestly, anywhere in your life. And it's been great to see Mr. English passing on what he's learned to the next generation and honestly, even the generation past them. Some great martial artists at his school. Thank you, Mr. English, for coming on the show today. If you want to find the show notes, you can head on over to whistlegigmartialartsradio.com. Check out photos, links, all kinds of other stuff that we've got going on there from this and 295 other episodes. If you want to support the show, you can join the newsletter list. You can check out our products at whistlekick.com or at Amazon. You can encourage someone else to come on the show as a guest. You can join our wholesale program. There are a multitude of ways that you can help make sure the show sticks around, which kind of sounds like I'm threatening you, but I'm not because it's going to stick around because I like doing it. And let's be honest, it doesn't really cost us that much money. We're doing it. We're investing the time because that's really the biggest cost on this thing is my time. We do it, one, because I love it, and two, because I think it's good for the martial arts that we capture these stories. Unfortunately, we've had two guests pass away, most recently, Grandmaster Junri. And while I don't pretend that the episodes that we've done with him or Hanchi Jim Smith are a true memorial of who they are as human beings or as martial artists, I'm happy that I had a chance to talk to them and that you can hear their words now or in the future. If you want to reach out to me, Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. We are at Whistlekick all over social media. Find this episode on YouTube, iTunes, pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts. You know, if you're really specific about it, you can even listen to this show on your Amazon Alexa devices. Yeah, it's kind of neat. All right. Thanks for your time today. I appreciate you listening. You help give me purpose. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>